Uh, okay, everyone, I think we're going to get started. Um, first of all, I just want to welcome you and thank you for coming. It's great to see everyone out here today. Uh, my name is Jeff Burt. I'm a research officer at CG. Uh, and and I, I'm really pleased that we could organize this talk because I think it comes at an excellent time. I think people fe felt a tremendous sense of relief uh, when the international community ultimately intervened in Libya and perhaps felt the same sense of relief when the French uh, captured uh, Laurent Gbagbo uh, just recently. It, it felt like it was the right thing to do and it, you know, I, I think after seeing the results of non-interventions, uh, I think the, the international community was relieved. Uh, but I think it also raised a lot of questions, fundamental questions, uh, about how the international community will intervene in the future and what it means uh, that we intervene in some cases and not others. Um, what is the benchmark for international intervention, in other words? Is it international law? Is it a convergence of interests? Uh, is it to stop certain kinds of abuses and not others? And I think fundamentally that this, this is about a struggle to balance uh, the principles of state sovereignty against individual human rights. And I think the two cases in, in Libya and Cote d'Ivoire are very interesting because uh, we're kind of being forced to assess what the limits are of state sovereignty and when we need to intervene uh, to address human rights concerns. So we're fortunate to have someone like Ali Vergi here to discuss these kinds of issues with us. Uh, he's going to look through the lens of Cote d'Ivoire and see what that intervention might tell us and what that situation might tell us uh, about some of these broader questions, perhaps. Uh, in fact, uh, it, we're fortunate enough to have Ali Vergi here. He actually worked on the elections in Cote d'Ivoire that led to this crisis. So someone certainly that has a lot of uh, first-hand experience in these issues. Uh, Ali is a senior researcher at the Rift Valley Institute uh, and an experienced analyst of contemporary African politics. He spent the majority of his time from 2005 to 2010 working in southern Sudan where he most recently was the principal political analyst for the EU observation mission. Uh, he's also served as, uh, as an election observer in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, Somaliland, recently in Cote d'Ivoire, Afghanistan, and Djibouti. He has appeared as a media commentator for Al Jazeera, the Associated Press, BBC, CBC, The Economist, Reuters, and others. He's also a frequent contributor to one of CG's projects, the Security Sector Reform Resource Center. And uh, he's the author of a forthcoming paper on Southern Sudan that we're about to publish. So I think we can all agree that uh, we're fortunate to have someone of his caliber join us and discuss these issues. Uh, and will everyone please join me in welcoming Ali Vergi. Well, thank you, Jeff, for that very uh, kind introduction, and thank you all for, uh, for coming here today. Uh, I'd be remiss without thanking uh, both Jeff and Mark for all their support over uh, the last year uh, in my dealings with uh, uh, the Security Sector Resource Reform Center, uh, Reform Resource Center. And of course, I must also uh, thank, uh, right off the bat, uh, I'd be remiss without, if I didn't, uh, Andrew Schramm, who uh, first uh, introduced me to uh, the family here in Waterloo. So I've been asked to speak today to the subject of intervention and the international response in, in Africa and the Middle East. And I must start by saying that I'm foremost a, a practitioner, as my university transcripts attest, uh, rather than an academic. But I have been reviewing in the last uh, few days some of those articles, uh, including those by uh, a rather famous uh, contemporary uh, Canadian politician who I've noticed uh, doesn't talk a huge amount uh, these days about international affairs. Um, but intervention is, of course, a huge, huge subject, and there's a lot that can be said. So I want to really channel, as Jeff said, uh, my presentation today through the lens of, of Côte d'Ivoire. And I'll try and speak for about uh, half an hour and then leave time for, for some discussion. What I want to suggest today is that the international community, or parts of it, are developing to some extent, and I'm qualifying a lot, and there's a reason for that, but are developing to some extent new norms. Uh, 
uh, that where what was once deemed impossible just a few short months ago uh, as instruments of international action is today considered after a few months of turmoil in the Middle East and North Africa not only possible but even necessary and perhaps even desirable. But at the same time that there has been a return, a very uh, strong return to the uh, return of the principle of, of intervention as long as it's in the strategic interest of uh, national interests of the great powers, whoever they might be. So I want to talk about uh, that uh, emergence of new norms coming out of uh, the Cote d'Ivoire case. And I also want to suggest that how we categorize the types of crises that we talk about in conflict today uh, across Africa, how that categorization, how that labeling also impacts on intervention. Let me start with Cote d'Ivoire. It's a country that has been surprisingly in the news quite a lot recently, and I say surprisingly because the gravest point of the crisis there in that country wasn't uh, the immediate uh, or the most recent events in Abidjan. In fact, it was the stalemate, or the most tense moment, wasn't the stalemate that we've seen over the last few months, but it was the runoff election itself in November and December of last year, where there was, comparatively to now, very, very little attention. Yes, there was some, and the Francophone press was, of course, much better at covering it, but after the polling had happened, after the crisis had, had started, it became written off as the classic, oh, this is Africa, elections in Africa, what a surprise. How sad, but are we really that, uh, are we really that uh, surprised that this has happened? And, you know, it's Cote d'Ivoire, it's not really that strategically significant. It's a setback, perhaps, uh, for democratization in general, for West Africa in particular, but so what? Let's leave it to ECOWAS, the economic community of West African states. Let's leave it to the African Union uh, to handle it. And as that situation stalled post-election, that humanitarian crisis deepened. And let me just uh, point out the map that I've got here. The, the orange lines that you can see uh, running horizontally there, those are areas of displacement. But they're not areas of displacement from now. They're areas of displacement from 2006. And really demonstrating that this was a crisis that had deep roots and actually was uh, very, very predictable. But as that situation stalled post-election, that humanitarian crisis became worse. Out of the peace agreements that ended Cote d'Ivoire's civil war had come a mandate for a UN mission, ONUSI, Organisation Nations Unies en Cote d'Ivoire, uh, with, a, with a mandated strength of about 9,000 um, soldiers and uh, about 1,000 civilians. And it had a very robust mandate and a very unusual mandate. And unusual, I say, because in addition to being a classic peacekeeping mission that we're uh, more or less familiar with, ONUSI was also given the role to certify the election. And that was the verb used in the, in, the, in the mandate, in addition to providing the technical and logistical assistance that the UN typically provides in such electoral contexts. What, do, what does certify mean? Well, such a word, such a role, had only been given to the UN a couple of times before. Uh, in East Timor, where the UN also organized the elections, and more recently in Nepal. The certification is a whole other level of UN involvement. And let me just quote from one of uh, ONUSI's briefing documents to give you an idea of what they had in mind. The certifier, or the UN, intends to safeguard the legitimate results of the elections with commitment, honor, and determination. He, and this is referring to the special representative of the Secretary General, he will ensure that the results are respected, the winner being in fact the person who won the election, and that the results will not be the subject of non-democratic contestations or compromise. In the improbable event that the legitimate results are contested through non-democratic means, the certifier, who as head of ONUSI, has also the mandate of maintaining peace and stability in Cote d'Ivoire, will safeguard the results by all means at his disposal to serve the Ivorian people. Very, very strong words, and this is far before the, the crisis of the recent months. But this mandate went terribly wrong. And when that critical moment came, when the top UN official in the country, the special representative of the Secretary General, the SRSG, uh, Mr. Choi, certified the results, the crisis erupted. He couldn't contain it. 
And when he was threatened with expulsion, when Onusi was threatened with imminent danger to its own mission, um, he pulled his punches, he backed down. The UN was left weak and divided, and the SRSG was under attack from all sides, both inside the country, from the opposition, from the government, and from New York, uh, and from the Security Council, and the mission seemed to be foundering very clearly. Now, on the other hand, ECOWAS, immediately post-election, was united for a little bit, until Ghana raised the viability uh, question about how can we actually uh, get rid of Laurent Gbagbo, and Nigeria started thinking about, well, we have our own domestic elections coming up, and in short, after a couple of weeks of this stalemate, the African Union, ECOWAS, were getting distracted. And it seemed that Gbagbo had correctly calculated that if I just hold on long enough, I'll be able to stick it out, I'll survive. And that was certainly his calculation, and it appeared to be a correct one. Except, what happened next? Well, let's fast forward a few months. Egypt has happened, Tunisia has happened, Libya is happening, and suddenly Cote d'Ivoire becomes interesting when you put it into the narrative of oppressed people suffering from a brutal dictator who won't give up power and who needs to leave now. But Cote d'Ivoire doesn't fit that narrative exactly because a full 46% of Ivorians in November actually voted for Bagbo, and he is genuinely popular. And it's certainly the case that he has probably lost some of that support uh, due to his actions since, but it's by no means the same sort of Mubarak or uh, Gaddafi-type regime. What's more, the country has recently been in a very similar position, uh, where about 10 years ago, an almost carbon copy situation developed, an electoral contest happened, uh, and Lauren Bagbo was the victim of the president in power who didn't, want to relieve, uh, who didn't want to leave office in the face of being defeated, tried to use the military to stay in control. And it was that conflict and the subsequent civil war that led to uh, Onusi and led to the French military intervention in Côte d'Ivoire, uh, uh, an operation called uh, Force Licon, uh, which was there at the request of the government eventually. So it's not exactly the same, but of course the narrative was compelling. What's clear is though that from November, a national and regional humanitarian crisis was brewing. Côte d'Ivoire is the second largest economy in West Africa. It employs people from all over the region, from Ghana, from Burkina Faso, Mali, Guinea, Liberia. It actually has far, far more of an implication for the stability of West Africa than does its much bigger uh, regional um, neighbor, Nigeria, which of course is the number one economy in Africa, uh, or sorry, in West Africa, the, the largest country in Africa by population. Uh, but Cote d'Ivoire has very, very serious regional implications as well. And it was clear that even before we were evacuated, and I left uh, the country on the 1st of December, that this was about to be a humanitarian disaster. And if we knew it, uh, the senior leadership of the UN, of Likon, of uh, the other embassies and so on in Abidjan also knew. But basically nothing happened. Onusi did nothing, Likon did nothing for several months, even as they could see right before their eyes this humanitarian crisis was happening. Keep in mind, they're already there. They're in the country. It's not that uh, we're talking about external intervention here. Thousands died because or despite of the presence of Onusi and Likon. And you might have heard a comment about uh, the town of Duakwe in the west where there has been uh, reports of a very serious humanitarian massacre and actually committed by pro uh, Watara forces, Bagbo's challenger. And I'll just show you on this map here uh, where exactly Duakwe is. It's a little bit difficult to see, uh, but if you can see uh, the region of uh, Dizuit Montan, very close to the border with uh, Guinea, it's just a bit uh, south of, of that there. Or sorry, a bit east of that. Um, south and east, so that's the, that's the area we're talking about there. It's on the northern side of the uh, Watara controlled uh, line of Cote d'Ivoire. I'll leave aside judgment on whether the UN or whether uh, the French there should have intervened. Well, I can tell you, and I've been there, it's a very small town. It's uh, a place where the UN base is actually very, very dominant, and uh, it's certainly not an unmanageable situation. But let's contrast that situation in January with the present situation in April, even last week, where the UN, the French, playing a decisive military role in allowing Ouattara to claim his office, uh, duly elected, uh, 
uh, by destroying Bagbo's heavy weapons and artillery, uh, targeting his elite forces, uh, putting the screws to the final resistance there in Abidjan. So what changed? Why in uh, January or why in November, December, when the humanitarian crisis, a much more compelling humanitarian crisis, you might even argue, was there, uh, was there no response? And later on, something does happen. Well, I think we can point to three things, at least, uh, that change the calculus. Firstly, the upheaval elsewhere on the continent, that although quite far from Côte d'Ivoire, Egypt and Tunisia and uh, Libya and so on, Quite far from Côte d'Ivoire, it was fitting into this narrative that I talked about earlier. Secondly, and perhaps more importantly, because the French had decided now that Laurent Bagbo, despite being an ally at some point, was now an intolerable liability. That yes, he might have been a liability uh, for some months already, but now it was an intolerable one, and he had to go. And finally, because of Côte d'Ivoire's fairly unusual economic structure, where it is a monocrop economy, dependent on the export of cocoa beans uh, for uh, a very large percentage of the state budget and the ability, unusually compared to other monocrops, for, uh, for the international community to cut off the flow of revenue by targeting that crop, by putting sanctions on it. Let me just quote you uh, the special representative again of the Secretary General, uh, what he said on the 14th of April. And just uh, look at these words. He said, the fundamental feeling is that Bagbo failed to win the hearts and minds of the population here. He underestimated the will of the people, and the credit must go to the Ivorian people. That is a remarkably bold and not very neutral statement, you could say, from the top UN official in country, who is now directly inserting himself into the political situation. Uh, a very interesting development. Which brings us to Libya, to Bahrain, and uh, to the question of inconsistencies on humanitarian intervention and this idea that I want to suggest that we are developing or there are being developed new norms. For on a scale of civilian protection or civilian atrocity and the regional implications, the regional difficulties, Cote d'Ivoire is certainly on par with Libya. Actually, far worse, far more people, um, far more violence, far more difficulties uh, in terms of uh, the regional implications. Even worse in terms of the long-term regional implications given the uh, problems in places like Guinea and Liberia that have also suffered their own conflicts. Bahrain, much, much smaller than both Cote d'Ivoire and, Li and Libya, has of course also seen huge violence as a proportion of the population far, far greater than either Cote d'Ivoire or Libya to the point where even protesters abroad of uh, Bahraini citizens who have done nothing at home uh, are being targeted for the actions of their sons and daughters. Uh, the most recent uh, case of this is that some protesters, Bahraini students in Manchester in the UK, uh, protested in the streets there and were identified by Bahraini intelligence whose families back in Bahrain then received visits uh, and were told in no uncertain terms, uh, you stop this or very serious things will happen to you. Where additionally in Bahrain, the government decided that rather than uh, negotiate or deal with the protesters, it would demolish the site of their protest, uh, the pull roundabout, rather than allow anything to continue there. The equivalent of the Egyptians uh, paving over Tahrir Square or the Chinese tearing up uh, Tiananmen. Really, really awful stuff. So let's contrast those three responses. Libya, not the easiest military country in which to engage, one that has a formidable uh, military component, a very large country, uh, one of the largest territories in Africa, Somehow, on a very, very short notice, an international coalition is assembled uh, on a, on really to, to, to act there. And even that uh, well-known bastion of freedom, the Arab League, is leading the call for action. To compare that with Côte d'Ivoire, where, as we've seen, despite being on the ground for months, in fact years, the international response initially was basically not to do anything. It's too bad for the civilians. And only at the moment when Ouattara is basically about to achieve victory anyway, let's assist him to finish the job. To a third example of Bahrain, where the Bahrainis have essentially ceded, for all practical purposes, their sovereignty to Saudi Arabia, neighboring uh, country, where there are credible reports that Saudi security agents are basically going village to village, 
in Shia areas in committing atrocities against minorities who are deemed to be more sympathetic to the opposition, um, where public assembly has been completely banned, where uh, several hundred people have disappeared without any uh, trace, and where the opposition is on the verge of being banned. But basically, nothing much is said because, yes, the Saudis are everybody's friend, a necessary ally, and also, by the way, Bahrain is a good friend of ours, a host of the US Fifth Navy, uh, a valuable ally in the Middle East for operations in Iraq, and so on. So if you take those three examples, you might say, how could I suggest in any way that there is a development of new norms in the presence of such wildly inconsistent responses? And anybody who lived through Egypt, uh, the international response there, which we all did, would be right to be skeptical as well. Because from one moment, the West particularly, not only the West, but certainly uh, the West included, was standing shoulder to shoulder with President Mubarak, uh, the stability of the regime, to moving to a position of being concerned with the regime and uh, calling for restraint, to calling for his ouster, all within uh, 10 days or so. And a similar approach in Yemen, in Libya, where certainly Gaddafi's former pariah status made it easier to distance oneself from him, but there was initially the concern of stability in the regime, and only later does the call come for him to go. Same thing in Yemen, valuable ally. We are for the stability of that country. We are for President Saleh, and then later uh, we change our minds. Well, I would suggest that new norms, or at least partially new norms, are there in a way because the fear of being on the wrong side of history is now, to some extent, becoming greater than the fear of instability. Uh, the long-standing cornerstone of a realist foreign policy, stability is the overarching goal, that no country, including the United States, certainly not China or Russia or India or any other country, is deluded enough to believe that it can any longer sustain the regimes it prefers in all situations, in all times, uh, although it still may be able to do so on a case-to-case -case basis. That for the US particularly, in an era where it may be a superpower still, but that polarity is shifting to some extent, that there's global economic difficulty, that there's overstretching because of Iraq, because of Afghanistan, because of the war on terror, only so much can be done, and eventually being seen to oppose change being seen to be pro-stability is actually counterproductive. Now, this is not exactly the moral standard of the responsibility to protect. Um, it might be something we call uh, the responsibility to prevent. The responsibility to prevent things from getting out of hand. Or perhaps the responsibility to contain the Al Jazeera effect, far more powerful than CNN's influence ever was. And while this sort of R2P, the other R, um, is also still drawing upon the International Commission's report back in 2001, which is described as part of the responsibility to protect, the responsibility to prevent, but in the context of talking about early warnings, root causes, uh, this is not quite as extensive. But it does suggest that if Al Jazeera coverage and brutality and somewhat paradoxically, the country is either very, very strategically important, crucially strategic, or, crucially unstrategic, then action can be contemplated. Which explains why Egypt is to be engaged, uh, the heart, the center of the Arab world, uh, crucially strategic for many, many reasons, but Bahrain is trumped by interests with Saudi Arabia. And Djibouti, for example, a very, very repressive country, which hasn't quite done enough to violate the rights of its citizens and kill quite enough people, is still um, trumping uh, for being a useful ally and not being violent enough to justify reproach, at least so far. And then Libya, where even the Arab world has had enough of uh, Mr. Gaddafi, but hasn't had enough so far of the situation in Yemen. So overall, this is apparently and quite clearly still far from a point where the, country, uh, the countries of the world, the great powers and the reluctant powers, accept that there is a doctrine uh, of a responsibility to protect and that uniform and consistent guiding principles exist or are necessary uh, for intervention. But there is a greater willingness to engage, knowing that long term, if you don't, the credibility gap of doing nothing may be even worse. But fundamentally, this comes back to a question of state interest. I also want to suggest that how intervention is perceived or how it is approached 
uh, it depends on how we conceptualize or categorize uh, the question of uh, conflict. So I want to suggest three labels, and of course this is something which uh, is very easy to do and to try and fit things into uh, nice boxes and doesn't completely work, but has its own purpose uh, of utility as well. So the three categories. The first is those countries which are mostly stable in their authoritarianism, but neglected. Neglected in the sense that they're not important enough to gauge the interest of the international community on a day-to-day -day basis. Countries like the Central African Republic, like Djibouti, like Eritrea, Equatorial Guinea, Gabon, Niger, that kind of country. Second, those countries that are in protracted crisis, ongoing large-scale uh, crises, Sudan, Chad, Congo, Somalia. And third, the new kind of crises into which we can draw part of the Middle East, Bahrain, Syria, and Egypt, uh, Libya, Tunisia, and Yemen, instability, conflict emerging from very long-term authoritarian situations. Now, again, I'll, I'll stress that these aren't perfect categorizations, but I want to uh, use them for a very uh, particular purpose to illustrate that in the first type of example, these long-term countries which are repressive, which uh, violate routinely uh, the rights of citizens, which commit violence against the rights of citizens, uh, whether they rise to the level of um, war crimes or acts of crimes against humanity is an open question, but they're generally stable authoritarian countries. that are backwaters, even by the standards of backwaters. Smaller countries, ignored even by their neighbors, ruled like fiefdoms, only really notable when something goes really, really wrong, or the leader dies, or somebody is kidnapped, or something like that. And short of a major convulsion of violence, or humanitarian catastrophe, nobody really cares. And even then, it may struggle for attention. And that's not going to change. Then there are the long-term crises, where everybody knows the government, the state, is as much part of the problem as it is part of the solution, where there are massive transborder humanitarian consequences, strategic considerations as well, but these are multi-layered, complex emergencies that don't have simple answers, where everybody knows something needs to be done, but solving the situation is far too difficult, or there just are no answers. And take Sudan, for example. At least four conflicts, north and south, north and west with Darfur, the, the conflict of the three areas which straddle the north-south boundary, uh, eastern Sudan, there's no single answer that can deal with all of that. Take Congo. Uh, where the conflict in the east is far, far removed from the issues and problems of Kinshasa in the west. But what's capturing attention now are the new crises. In retrospect, they appear, these countries, ripe for change, even if the underlying dynamics are basically the same as 10 years ago or even 20 years ago at the end of the Cold War. But in light of other dictators falling, there now appears to be promise here that intervention is seen as a more noble gesture, a more sustainable gesture, perhaps a more realistic, more impactful than in the long-term crises where uh, nobody has illusions about solving the fundamental issues. And, as I suggested earlier, this question of not being one to see, be seen on the wrong side of history. But I also want to suggest that these categorizations are, to some extent, imagined, ideological, as much as they are real, even if there are real elements to them, even if you can make a case uh, to support them. That if Sudan or if Congo is too complicated, or Gabon or Niger is too unimportant, that that's how they remain. Which brings us back to Cote d'Ivoire. For stolen elections, flawed elections, rigged elections are not uncommon in Africa. But somehow, for the UN, for the French, for the European Union, for the West more generally, uh, for ECOWAS, for the African Union as well, it moved from being a neglected country, one of many, or if you prefer the other category, uh, a long-term emergency where civil war had, had been part of the recent past, to being one where it's a new crisis. It's a crisis that fits into uh, the paradigm of change, where to support President-elect Alassane Ouattara is to support freedom, and to do nothing is to support impunity, to support injustice, uh, and to, by implication, to allow Laurent Gbagbo to remain uh, in power and to continue his uh, rule of violence. Of course, the reality is not as binary. But if it helps in justifying consciences and justifying what I'll leave in question marks as interventions, 
it's certainly very helpful. Um, thank you very much. I'll leave it there, and I'll be happy to take your questions. Should we take more? Or? Um, yeah, if there are any more questions, take one more. Yeah? Um, so, in your categorizations of these interventions, I think you, you pointed out that the question is sort of dividing these important categories. But I was, I'm not at all familiar with the area you're talking about, but I'm very familiar with what happened in Kosovo and in Bosnia. And, and I mean, you mentioned the role of the UN Special Representative, right? Whereas in Bosnia, Should we take one more, or is that yeah, good? One, no, that's fine, that's fine. Uh, okay, so why don't you just Okay, those two? so I've been asked to just repeat the questions uh, for the sake of the recording, and the first one is uh, to, I think, if I can summarize what you're asking, is there an argument that can be made for uh, Canada to have a strategic involvement in any of these places, um, and that I'm suggesting that a strategic interest is very key to the, to the question of intervention? And I'm not suggesting in the response to that question that the strategic value or the strategic imperative to become involved is the right one. I'm saying that's what's there. And that is important because it's important that we don't delude ourselves into thinking that there is a, a very, very sophisticated or a very, very um, large evolution in the question of are we actually implementing this based on the principles of a responsibility to protect? Are we actually, is this actually being done um, on, on purely humanitarian grounds? I'm suggesting it isn't, that that element is very, very important. So certainly in terms of Canada's strategic interests, um, you can justify very, very little as being um, an intervention in Africa, at least, uh, which I, I'm, I'm trying to uh, confine my analysis to, uh, to suggest that there is beyond the humanitarian imperative, beyond one where um, you know, we are concerned about the protection of human rights and so on, there is a strategic uh, argument there, except for the two questions, which I want to suggest are, are long-term ones. One is the question of, does instability anywhere in the world create long-term uh, a problem of exporting, of delivering to other places, including to Canadian shores, um, that instability, and I would argue that very clearly, uh, yes, it does. Uh, the second is uh, the question of um, migration and economic interdependence. And certainly, in terms of the uh, turmoil that we've seen in Libya, for example, in North Africa in general, um, hundreds of thousands have been displaced, not only Libyans, people from sub-Saharan Africa resident in Libya. Uh, the same thing in Cote d'Ivoire that Cote d'Ivoire's conflict has displaced hundreds of thousands of people into the neighboring countries. That those people won't just disappear. They won't necessarily be able to return either. That long term, uh, the creation of more refugees, more internally displaced and externally displaced people in the world 
uh, pushes people to more desperate measures. And that, again, is a strategic concern for a country that is built on immigration. Uh, in terms of the, the second question, um, I, I wouldn't claim in any way to be an expert on the Balkans or on Kosovo, but you're certainly right. This idea that uh, particularly within uh, the UN, within certain missions within the UN, uh, there is this long-term uh, agenda. But I do think that in terms of Kosovo, if we compare it with some of the UN activities, interventions in Africa, uh, UNMIS, for example, in Sudan, uh, former MONUC and now MONUSCO in uh, the Congo, ONUC in Cote d'Ivoire, uh, the agenda is far, far different. That, yes, in Cote d'Ivoire, the special representative found a voice, decided to be more robust. Uh, there's also internal politics there. He's a South Korean. Um, it was deeply embarrassing to the Secretary General uh, to have his special representative seem very weak and unable to, to deal with the situation, somebody he had recommended for the job. Uh, and so there is certainly an element of uh, personal internal politics there as well. Um, but I think in general, across the UN missions in Africa, it's quite a different response. It's quite a different sort of agenda that there isn't a desire, there isn't an appetite for the same kind of long-termist approach that we're seeing perhaps in, Balkan, in the Balkans or perhaps we saw in East Timor um, some time ago, that these mandates are being renewed on a very, very short-term basis, that all of those missions that I mentioned are coming up for renewal uh, very, very quickly, that there is a general desire, uh, and I'll note Southern Sudan in this, the, 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 what will be Africa's newest country come July, um, for a lighter footprint, for lesser obligations in terms of intervention. So I, I wouldn't necessarily agree that there is a long-term uh, UN uh, desire to, to do state building, to do nation building in a lot of these places. Are there other questions? Don't be shy. Jeff? I'll, I'll add a question on my own. Um, what do you think about the role of the kind of supply side of the equation? That the international community uh, has uh, a supply of airplanes and bombs right. that it can be involved in one scenario, not another. And, and the, this kind of idea of, you know, to a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Uh, okay. How likely is it that mission that's based on bombarding people from the air is going to make a difference in a different context to talk about. Certainly it's not going to do anything in Bahrain. It doesn't seem like it was well suited to Cote d'Ivoire. Uh, is Libya a unique situation? Uh, and, and if the international community's uh, standard for intervention is going to be, what, what, where can we intervene easily? Where can we intervene with no casualties? Where can we intervene without putting boots on the ground? What does that say for uh, the future? Uh, well, that's a very good question, and I'll just repeat it by saying that uh, you're asking about the question of uh, the supply side of the international community has finite resources, a uh, finite number of planes and, and troops and so on, and where should it intervene uh, if it has to make a judgment? It can't be everywhere. Clearly, that's the, the implication of what you're saying, and perhaps it should be predicated on where um, it's easier or where it's more possible. And certainly, I would also refer you back to the doctrine of R2P, which suggests that the intervention where it happens has to be uh, possible. It has to have a chance of success. It's not just a, a no-hope option. Um, but I would also suggest in terms of uh, what you raise about Libya uh, and the intervention there, that actually it's pretty easy to uh, send in a few fighter planes to uh, patrol the skies, particularly when the uh, heavy work of uh, defeating the anti-aircraft uh, weapons and so on has already been done. And you're right, there are relatively few cases where uh, an international air blockade is the appropriate response. Uh, and certainly Cote d'Ivoire um, wasn't similar in that sense, uh, where the resources of the state in terms of the Air Force were being used to uh, punish civilians. Um, but I think it's also important to consider th two things. One, in terms of what you suggest about uh, the supply side, if we return to Cote d'Ivoire, there were troops on the ground. They were there. And still, um, because of various considerations, nothing much happened. So at least in that example, 
I, I, it wasn't any talk about going in uh, with uh, a lot more. These aren't Western peacekeepers for the, for the most part. The French military forces outside of the UN command, even though they cooperate, but the UN force itself uh, is from the, the typical UN troop contributing countries. I think Canada had uh, two or three people there. Um, but you know, there, that, there wasn't a, an interest of, well, we're going to commit uh, blood and treasure to this conflict here. Um, it was, you know, what sort of things should they do? Should, since they're there, should they actually do something more, particularly given the very strong uh, mandate with which they'd been sent? Um, but I think, you know, if we talk about Bahrain or we talk about other countries, um, you know, the, the question is, does intervention only happen in one way, I think? Does it only happen in the sense of imposing by military force? Um, or is it more about uh, a consistent and coordinated and response that applies the same principles? That if you are torturing or if you are um, violating on a massive scale the rights of your citizens, you are held to account for that. The Libyan no-fly zone is interesting because directly in one of Libya's immediate neighbors, Darfur in Sudan, uh, the same question about civilian protection came up. Um, from 2004 onwards, that in Darfur, there was an air bombing campaign targeting civilians by the Sudanese Air Force. And, you know, the arguments that were raised at that time were that, well, you know, Darfur is too big. Darfur is smaller than Libya. Darfur is too complicated. Darfur is too far away. Um, now, I'm not arguing that a no-fly zone should have been imposed. There are other reasons why it shouldn't have been. But those weren't necessarily the arguments that were predominating. It was, it's too difficult, you know, we might lose some, um, some planes, it'll be, it'll be a challenge as well. Um, I think that if the question of responsibility to protect, if the question of interventionism is to have any credibility as a concept, it has to uh, be consistent, or it has to be more consistent and less hypocritical. And if we're going to be hypocritical about its, you know, its, its, um, um, its introduction or how it's implemented, then that needs to be stated, that needs to be uh, said, that we don't pretend, we don't dress it up as something else. That might not be very convenient, it might not be very politically convenient, but it undermines the whole doctrine to suggest that something happening somewhere else is actually uh, not the, the same thing at all. Andrew. Uh, so the question is, in the event that there is a contested election or that uh, there's a contested uh, democratic process, is there a greater willingness? That democratic uh, development is clearly uh, a key uh, organizing principle for uh, concern and that uh, concerns emerge around elections and similar events. And I think, you know, it's, it's, there's a lot that can be said on that, so I, I don't want to uh, go on too long. But one of the interesting questions, I think, is the automatic inclusion in any sort of peace deal, in any sort of negotiation, in any sort of uh, intervention from a preventative point of view of democratic processes, of democratic events, largely, uh, as you suggest, through uh, the question of an election. And that when that election goes terribly wrong or is contested, that everybody is, well, how is that possible? And why, why did that happen? And this is uh, unacceptable and so on. And I think it, it requires before intervention in terms of the likelihood of success, a consideration, a reevaluation of does it automatically just get in there? Does it automatically, you say that, you know, you have a five year transition period during which all problems will be solved and then the election is gonna happen and everybody will, will live very peacefully and uh, happily thereafter. I don't think the evidence suggests that that is a reasonable expectation Yet that's more or less the model that is employed in country after country, both in Africa and elsewhere. And particularly if the causes of conflict, if the other aspect of the, uh, of the root problems are not addressed, formal imposition of uh, 
democratic systems, democratic processes, or nominally democratic systems or, or processes is not going to, one, be sustainable, two, be uh, long-term accepted or seen with credibility by the constituents of that country itself, the most important people to validate uh, a vote, not international observers, not the UN, no, not, not anybody else, those people themselves. And, and so I would suggest that you know, in terms of intervention in the face of what we see later uh, as a violation of democratic principles or you stole the election, therefore we must act, um, that yes, that will remain necessary because what other option is there in the sense of you have uh, all of these countries or almost all of them have committed to international obligations, international standards for democratic elections and so on. They've invited uh, uh, various groups to observe them and, and uh, that sort of thing. But at the same time, it shouldn't be a great surprise when the election goes terribly wrong. And that predicated on that and the expectation that a failed election may eventually down the road mean that you have a whole lot more mess to deal with, a whole lot more mess that's going to cause humanitarian crisis, that's going to cause difficulty in terms of rebuilding, in terms of uh, addressing all sorts of other priorities that, in which there might be setbacks. Um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a very uh, serious uh, re-evaluation is needed. I mean, let's just look very practically at Cote d'Ivoire now. Ouattara is now the undisputed president. He's in the presidential palace and so on. He is duly elected as president of the country. But what kind of inheritance does he have? He has a completely divided society. He has a completely devastated economy. Um, yes, he is the nominal victor of this vote, and congratulations to him for that. But he has a huge amount of work to be done, and he has a huge number of people to reconvince, to rebuild trust in, uh, both from his supporters and from people who supported the other guy. And then, you know, if in five years' time the next vote happens and he stands again and somebody else is his challenger and the vote is violent or the vote is contested, um, we shouldn't be surprised given the, the inheritance that he's had to begin with. Chinese and the Russians to 
Um, moreover, um, the assets were there. The Mediterranean region is one area where NATO has a lot of military assets to deploy in this region. And the actual terrain, despite the fact that it's a big country, was actually quite conducive for these types of air mm -hmm. operations. So, um, so I wanted to also make that comment and get your reaction to it. Um, because the, there isn't going to be international resolve to intervene on any issue. Right. But where there is, where there are the factors in place, and intervention is justified and also authorized by the United Nations, is, is, does that make it illegitimate? Right. Uh, well, I hope, Mark, you're not going to make me repeat that uh, no. comment for the, uh, for the record. But in terms of your uh, two questions, uh, reflections on the nature of uh, contemporary interventions and the implications thereof, in including uh, this uh, idea that we are seeing um, coalitions of the willing. Uh, and then the question of uh, rebuilding, that intervention is the first step, but it might be uh, better not to intervene at all. Um, if, um, you know, the question is that harm may be uh, a likely outcome and that do no harm should be the, the first principle. Uh, I think on the first question, yes, of course you're right. It is this suggestion, there is this emergence of, of coalitions of, of the willing and that this is the, the model for action, that it's easier to get that in place than a uh, Security Council resolution or um, to get the uh, unanimous consent of uh, every uh, player. Um, but I think at the same time, we, and it's, it, it comes to this point about uh, the Arab League and regional organizations, and I want to suggest that leaving aside the Arab League, the, the real question is the sub-regional organizations, uh, that whether it's the Economic Community of West African States, ECOWAS, uh, whether it's the Gulf Cooperation Council, the GCC, uh, for um, the Gulf countries, that this is now one of the primary focuses for what is acceptable behavior, or what is acceptable um, for uh, action to take place, and uh, that you know, we are going to see more and more that be the avenue, that be uh, the, the source of, of things, that you can't get the African Union, all of its members, uh, to agree there's always going to be somebody uh, unhappy about it. But if you look at a more uh, regional or a more a um, manageable block of countries, perhaps you can. Perhaps you can get things like that. So I, you know, I think in, in retrospect, in considering what's happened uh, in the region in the last few years, or the last few months, uh, that that has become something which the regional organizations which largely didn't want to consider, didn't want to face the reality before, now do, um, that they, they are very much uh, engaged with that. Uh, I, I would certainly agree, and uh, I didn't want to um, get into the whole issue of rebuilding because, yes, it is a, a huge question in and on its own. But at the same time, I would argue that in any situation, no matter where, and we can take uh, Afghanistan as a prime example of this, that success is not assured in any case, no matter the strategic uh, considerations, implications, and so on. And that you know, none of us and uh, none of us that work on these issues can say with absolute certainty, even with reasonable certainty, in most of the cases, most of the time, that actually this will be uh, sustainable, this is going to work, uh, especially when we know uh, very well that political masters um, may have uh, short-term priorities that don't coalesce with longer ones, that the Security Council also has the same sort of constraints. Um, but that doesn't change the fact that the question of peace and stability, wherever it happens in, uh, in Africa, has uh, very often, and I think it's difficult, this is where it becomes difficult because it really is necessary to look at the circumstances, as you suggest with Libya, on a case-by-case -case basis, but where the circumstances suggest that uh, doing nothing actually does nothing long-term to address the structural problems there. That, for example, again, if I return to Cote d'Ivoire, that the fact that in this case, I would suggest the confluence of factors was even stronger because the forces were already there, because there was a compelling humanitarian imperative where the government's army was able to more or less do whatever it wanted because nobody was going to stand up to them. And that President Bagbo uh, had cowed some of his neighbors into thinking, you know, don't, uh, don't mess with me. So yes, rebuilding is the 
very, very important uh, long-term logical conclusion of this. And this is going to be the challenge, as I mentioned, with a lot of these UN missions in Africa that have their mandates ending. That isn't the consideration. That isn't the issue. It's stabilize, and then you know we can draw down. We can uh, hand over. It's, uh, there's a responsibility for the state uh, itself to do this. And you could argue, and again, I think it depends on case to case, that that may, in fact, mean later on that the conditions, the circumstances for another uh, intervention or another sort of action are needed. Um, I want to suggest, uh, and in response to your comment, uh, you know, I agree and I outlined in my presentation that there were a confluence of factors in Libya that were present or were not present elsewhere. Um, but I think what's important is not to suggest that you know, so-and-so is true in this case, therefore that disproves the other or whatever, but the point being that the consistency with which stuff is talked about. Because intervention doesn't necessarily mean in the case of Bahrain, let's say, that there is an occupation or a no-fly zone imposed or whatever. Yes, I agree, that would be ridiculous. But at the same time, for there to be almost nothing said at all is, I think, the point. That intervention uh, is a useful concept because it can be used on the ground, and that is not always uh, you know, possible to do, and it comes back to Jeff's point about limited resources do sometimes mean tough choices. Although I would suggest that um, in Libya, the presence of the Arab League uh, intervention in it, or the Arab League participation in it, was far from realized in a way it could have been. The entire GCC countries and the Arab League have combined a military force, an air force, that is about 20 times the size of what Libya has, yet there was very little contribution. So I would reject the idea that there isn't enough military capacity in the world to deal with many of the problems that do arise. Uh, but you know, the, the, the issue for me is the question of, do we say consistently where uh, there are issues that we are concerned with because we subscribe to these principles or not? The response may vary, it has to vary. There is no one size fits all solution for any of these places, but I think that's the, the question on which uh, we should consider. Yes. Um, well, I try and avoid uh, subscribing to any labels myself, and maybe I'll ask uh, Andrew later to come and tell me what I, what I am, what I fit into. But I think all I'm suggesting is that the doctrine is there. The doctrine is talked about that if we talk about Libya, if we talk about other places, it's put in humanitarian terms. This is protecting civilians. But very clearly, um, that is a consideration, yes, but it's not the defining one. It's not the consideration that has motivated, in the end, ultimately, um, the intervention there without, as Mark suggested, without, as I suggested, the confluence of other factors, whether that is the media coverage there, whether that is the um, agreement in the neighborhood to do it, whether that is just uh, Gaddafi having worn out after 40 years uh, his, uh, his welcome. So, you know, I think it is a question to say what when we talk about language, when we talk about categorizing the types of actions that are contemplated, what do we actually mean? And let's call what it is what it is. And you know, it's convenient here to use the shorthand to say, yes, this was an intervention and Canada's participation in it as well, an intervention to protect the rights of civilians, to defend against those horrible um, armies that uh, Gaddafi is deploying. But actually, when you start blowing up stuff that uh, isn't directly related to um, protecting civilians, that when you start to directly engage with the army, um, when you start to do those kind of things, it's beyond that. And you know, I don't necessarily have a problem with that. I think it's a judgment that uh, we can only leave to history. Uh, but I think it is important to not be hypocritical about it. <laughs>
Um, I think we have time for maybe one last quick question. If there is, yes. Yes, I would like to ask something about the uh, UN peacekeeping. Yeah. Uh, in the lead up to kind of the security call on Bangladesh, uh, you saw them being harassed, uh, shot at, you know, arrested, detained, having their weapons confiscated. Meanwhile, all these people all around are dying on a large scale uh, in a very systematic and organized way. Uh, the question is, would better peacekeeping allow for uh, a more successful setting up of interventions or allow for interventions to be uh, more successful overall? And you've asked uh, the question in terms of uh, Cote d'Ivoire and how the peacekeepers were performing there. I mean, again, I think that if we're talking about 9,000 troops on the ground in Cote d'Ivoire, then the expectation that with a mandate, with the full uh, backing of the Security Council, with the idea that they can take all necessary measures, then yes, uh, you know, there is clearly an, an obligation on them not to just uh, turn the other cheek, perhaps, but to be a bit more activist. But of course, we need to be careful with this. And you know, I, again, I think it's difficult to generalize because peacekeeping does even though we like to put it under uh, one shorthand, come in many different forms. And you know, it's a very different question if we're talking about monitoring a military ceasefire between two sides, a classic peacekeeping sort of responsibility, and something uh, where actually we're talking about perhaps a rapid reaction force or some kind of uh, very militarily robust UN activity. Um, but I think it's inevitable that the countries or many of the countries where the UN is going to have a presence or where the Security Council is going to have a peacekeeping mission are the same countries where um, humanitarian catastrophe, disaster, instability is also likely. Does that mean that those are necessarily countries where you know, a, a greater intervention happens? Clearly Cote d'Ivoire has some special uh, differences because of the long-standing French presence there, because of the long-standing French military uh, commitment there as well, but you know, there, there could certainly be a conversion. So I think if you're working in the DPKO and you're thinking about this kind of thing, the correct answer would not be to say, well, let's just hope it doesn't happen in country X, Y, or Z, but you know, consider that actually down the road uh, in some of these very complicated countries, you may need that additional assistance or whether you need it or not or whether you like it or not, it's gonna happen. And so there's all kinds of questions about the neutrality, the ability, the support, the intelligence on both the peacekeeping side, both the military side of the peacekeeping, as well as the civilian side, as well as the intelligence side. And you know, what this has in terms of the Security Council viewing the possibility that UN forces or UN presences can be a stepping stone, a bridge to some of these kind of things. So I think there's a, there's a whole bunch of issues wrapped up in that, but uh, it's, a, it's a good question. And I think if you're a planner for uh, uh, the UN in New York, it's one that uh, you should uh, be thinking very deeply about. So I think we'll probably leave it there, but thanks, Jeff. So uh, thanks everyone for your great questions, of course. Thank you, Ali, for a thoughtful, very thought-provoking presentation. Uh, as a token of CG's appreciation, much. I'll give you that. Thank and you. please, everyone, join me in thanking Ali Bridges.